I know there's a couple people over, <laughs> over here on this side. Okay, uh, well, you're here. Okay, <laughs> welcome to the Roy Branson Legacy Sabbath School class. And let's see. Today we're going to have Gary Shardy. I'll announce him in just a moment. And next week is going to be uh, David. Who's that? Charles Scriven. Scriven, and then Graybill after that, isn't it? Oh uh, no, Sifa Tonstead. Okay, we'll get him in there. Okay, look at your. Is everyone getting the emails? Okay, so look on there. You can see them. So, okay. Ah, and I do have offering envelopes here. If you'd like to leave something to the Roy Branson Legacy Cyber School Class, mark it especially if it's for the it presenter. Is. <laughs> I said if it's for the presenter, you want to offer Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> loose offering will go to the yeah. presenter. <laughs> anyway, today we're it's our privilege to have Gary Chartier and the book. Um, you want to hold the book up? And Gary, you've done a fantastic job of that. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. I haven't read every word, but I've read a little bit in each chapter. Yeah. I mean, it's very good. It takes a lot of work to put, put a book out like that. And I think it'll be one that we can, it'll be an anthology. Anyway, Gary is Associate Dean at the School of Business uh, at La Sierra University. He is a philosopher, administrator, and today he's going to be a theologian. He's going to talk about his chapter in the book. One of the things that Gary and I have in common is that we share the same office at La Sierra University. We did. We did. But at different times. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was a big enough office if we actually put it together. But, but anyway, uh, so that's what one thing Gary had. So I appreciate Gary. Gary has been here uh, several times. And I'm trying to think is there anything else I should say today? If not, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Gary. And uh, I know, Gary, that you're going to have to leave right at 11 30. So anyway, uh, is, is the mic on? My mic? Now is it on? <laughs> okay, let's just bow our heads. Gracious Father, we thank you for this day. We pray that you'll guide uh, in our discussions and you watch over us in Christ's name. Amen. It's a real pleasure to be here in the Royal Ransom Legacy Sabbath School class, as it always is. I'm always. Uh, uh, always uh, delighted when I have the chance to share time with this group of stimulating and engaging people. And uh, it is uh, uh, particularly delightful, I think, to talk about this topic in a group presided over by my friend David Larson, who, uh, as I uh, uh, was uh, talking with him about a few minutes ago, uh, was the respondent when this piece was first uh, first presented, uh, an earlier version of it was presented in uh, the uh, what, spring of 1994 in uh, the old campus chapel over here that no longer exists and then uh, in uh, Constantine Hall of La Sierra. Um, the chapter has been pretty substantially rewritten largely because the version that I used uh, when I gave the talk was drawn from what became my book, The Analogy of Love, and it didn't seem like a particularly good idea to just repeat what I had said uh, verbatim from that book. And so what I did when we uh, uh, finally got around to turning the uh, lectures into a book uh, was to write new material, but I was covering, I think, pretty much the same basis, but trying to frame them in a somewhat different way, as I, I hope I've learned something in the last 22 years. As I observed to Dave, I think one thing I've learned is that he's more likely to have been right back then than I, uh, than I thought at the time. Uh, so the, um, the point of the chapter is to think about Christology and soteriology, to think about the identity of Jesus and the activity of Jesus, hi Bernard, in relation to two themes. Um, first of all, the kind of guiding focus of the chapter, it seems to me, is the idea that if we're going to understand Christology and soteriology, and for that matter, anything else in Christian theology, we've got to do so in light of a credible account of divine action. And uh, 
So that's the first, uh, the first point. And second, uh, I want to stress in the chapter, whatever else we say needs to be consistent with a clear commitment to unabashed divine love. Okay? So uh, those are not unconnected ideas, right? Because if we think about divine love as um, uh, the, the most important thing we want to say about God, and I'm delighted the book really starts in those terms with Rick's chapter, with the, the great uh, quote uh, uh, from Charles Hartshorn talking about uh, the centrality of love to what we want to say about God. Uh, and I think that that's carried through in a number of other places in the book. Um, if that's what we want to say, then we obviously need to have an account of divine action that's consistent with that. What does that mean? Well, for me, the idea is that when we, when we talk about the problem of evil, as we sometimes do, this is uh, sometimes, and I think unfortunately, disconnected from talk about divine love. Uh, sometimes it's framed in terms of divine goodness, a conflict between the reality of evil and divine goodness that can be pitched at a pretty abstract level. It can seem quite abstract because talk about uh, divine goodness can cover all kinds of different bases. Uh, sometimes, for instance, when people say God is good, all they seem to mean is that God exhibits a kind of austere metaphysical perfection that doesn't seem to have any consequences for what we say about God's love. But if we regard the focus not just as goodness in the abstract, but as love, then it seems to me we begin to see how uh, these, these two concerns with, with the divine action and, and love begin to fit together. So you've got some people who uh, suppose that all we need to say about uh, uh, divine goodness in the face of evil uh, is something very narrow. Uh, uh, you know, God, for instance, I think about one uh, Calvinist philosopher, Roy Clouser, who says, look, all we can expect God to do uh, is keep God's promises. And presuming God hasn't promised to do anything, uh, uh, anything else, there's no particular reason to suppose God to behave that way. Now, one obvious problem there is it seems to me that Clauser doesn't actually tell us why we should expect God to keep God's promises, right? That is, if there's not some underlying, uh, you know, uh, divine goodness on the basis of which we can understand and interpret and account for uh, adherence to divine promises, why would we expect that any more than we would expect anything else? But in any case, this, so that these sorts of views float around. Once we instead embrace a kind of robust picture of divine goodness as love, then, of course, we begin to run into the challenges that, uh, that evil uh, in the world presents. And our job today is certainly not going to be to resolve the problem of evil, uh, which is, has obviously been the dramatic, uh, demanding challenge to theistic belief uh, throughout uh, uh, the uh, the history of, of humankind. But what we can say, I think, at minimum, is that an account of divine action has to be consistent with whatever we end up wanting to say in response to the problem of evil. And what we say in response to the problem of evil has got to be consistent, I think, with our account of God as thoroughly loving. Okay? So if God is love, then what that suggests, it seems to me, is that God isn't in the business of intending evil. So the views in accordance with which uh, God uh, does evil to bring about good uh, would seem to place God in a morally inferior position to St. Paul, you know, who famously said, shall we do evil that uh, good may come? God forbid. So uh, we don't want those sorts of views. We, we, we want some kind of view, it seems to me, in which um, while there certainly may sometimes be foreseen but unintended side effects of divine action that are undesirable, what God intends at any rate uh, and uh, what can reasonably fall within the, uh, uh, the scope of divine activity, uh, divine deliberate activity, will, will be loving. 
Okay? So what this leads to, it seems to me, is a kind of fork in the road. There are a couple of different directions we can go here. One would be to say, uh, it, once we grant, therefore, that uh, God doesn't will uh, or intend, uh, that is to say, the evil that occurs, and yet the evil occurs, right? It's real. Uh, we can't, I think, be sympathetic at all to those views which would seek to dismiss evil as an illusion. There are people who suggest that uh, evil is an illusion or perhaps alternatively um, something that appears to be evil turns out to have some long-term good, uh, good consequence and therefore is rendered okay. But once we've taken those sorts of dodgy views off the table, we recognize there really is unequivocal evil that occurs, then it seems to me we come to this fork in the road and we've got two options. And my job today is not going to be to uh, defend one of those options, but simply to note them and to note uh, their implications for what we want to say about Christ and salvation. So, in brief, if evil occurs and there is God and God doesn't will that evil, then if that is, the evil that happens happens contrary to God's intentions, then it seems to me we've got these two options. Option number one is that there is some kind of moral constraint on divine action in virtue of which God doesn't uh, stop uh, these evils from occurring, uh, or at least does so less frequently than we might suppose. That's option one. This normative or moral constraint that divine, it would be inconsistent with divine goodness to, to do so. Um, the other fork in the road is um, that the constraint is metaphysical of some kind. So there's something about the, uh, uh, the nature of divine power and the nature of the world in virtue of which uh, God can't do that, okay? So those possibilities <coughs> have in many, perhaps not all cases, very similar practical uh, consequences. That is, in both cases, they allow for divine action in the world that is persuasive, but not divine action in the world that is coercive, right? Because if there were coercive uh, divine action, uh, then uh, that would be precisely the kind of act, divine action that would seem to involve overriding those features in the world that lead to various evils. So uh, somebody who supposes that the constraints are moral or normative, one kind or another, might think that occasionally there would be reason for uh, coercive divine action, for, if you will, the miraculous, though not every proponent of that view would, uh, would uh, agree that there was that sort of... Uh, uh, that sort of divine action. So you've really got uh, perhaps three views in a sense. You've got uh, coercive divine action is ruled out metaphysically, coercive divine action is ruled out morally, or coercive divine action is ruled out morally most of the time. Um, but in all, of, but all of those views uh, make it the case that uh, there is no reason ordinarily to expect coercive divine action the divine action, rather, will be expected to be persuasive, that divine providence will occur in and through the uh, activities and the events of the creaturely world and will therefore be constrained by the responsiveness, by the freedom in one way or another, of creatures and the integrity of natural processes. So if a, a plausible response to the problem of evil brings us to this kind of picture of divine action, what does that mean for what we want to say about Christology and soteriology? And that's the point of the chapter. So I begin the chapter by talking in general terms about the problem of evil, and then I go on to talk about Christ and salvation. So first of all, then, with regard to Christology, and uh, since I want to leave room for a conversation here, uh, probably I will jump fairly quickly through some of this material, and then we can elaborate uh, more in discussion with each other. But in the case of Christology, it seems fairly clear that so Christians have wrestled with, of course, how to think about the identity of Jesus since the beginning of Christianity. And we can tell that there's a big difference, a quite dramatic difference that's evident even in the New Testament itself, right? Um, it's not the case that, as I think as some sorts of uh, um, historically naive views would have it, um, 
the uh, New Testament authors uh, have a clearly defined, uniformly embraced view, uh, and then it just takes a long time for that view from the biblical materials to work themselves out into orthodoxy. It's not that the history doesn't uh, look like that at all. Rather, we have a, you know, a range of views pointing to uh, what appears to be some kind of developmental process, just in, in terms of how the earliest Christians are thinking about the identity of Jesus. So we have, for instance, in the uh, Pentecost speech of St. Peter, uh, the claim that Jesus of Nazareth was a man approved by God. And uh, the idea is, uh, in that speech, Jesus is presented as a kind of prophetic figure who was killed uh, by uh, those in authority and then uh, whose uh, ministry is validated by his being raised from the dead. But it's, he's very, very clearly asserted in that passage to be a man approved by God. But then we find ourselves, by the end of uh, the, uh, uh, the New Testament, uh, in uh, what would often, at any rate, be thought to be one of the older, the older books there, uh, Fourth Gospel, in the famous uh, uh, prologue to the Fourth Gospel, uh, there's this account of the Logos, the order, pattern, meaning of the universe that is God's self-expression, and the Logos becomes flesh in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, this is obviously a, a very dramatic difference from Jesus is a man approved by God. And of course, uh, the fourth gospel isn't the only place this happens. We have, we find in the first gospel, uh, for instance, uh, you know, uh, Mary is told that uh, Jesus is going to be called Emmanuel, God with us. And so, uh, clearly, as the uh, early decades of Christianity move along, uh, it's the case that uh, the early Christians are increasingly coming to see. Um, the acts of Jesus as the acts of God, to see, the, uh, to see uh, Jesus as God's presence in the world. And then this becomes cashed out over time in uh, the um, conciliar definitions of Jesus' identity, uh, notably uh, those at the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Chalcedon. And uh, so here we have the, uh, the claim in uh, the Nicene Creed uh, that uh, uh, one and the same person is both truly human and truly God. And uh, then in the, Nicene, in the uh, Chalcedonian uh, definition, uh, this whole host of uh, careful qualifications uh, uh, emphasizing the unity, uh, the integrity of the person of Jesus uh, as uh, at the same time the person of God the Son and uh, at the same time the distinction between deity and humanity. And there's a very delicate balancing act there. But this way of talking that we find notably in Nicaea and Chalcedon is a way of talking that then yields what we can call a Christology of identity, right? a Christology of identity which affirms that um, we can identify again, as I to use the language I used before, the acts of Jesus with the acts of God. We can identify the ultimate metaphysical subject of the life of Jesus as God, uh, God the Word, uh, how we will, depending on your Trinitarian theology. That's a separate issue. But in any event, uh, there's, a, there's a straightforward identification of God as the ultimate subject of this human life. That's an identity Christology. Now, an identity Christology does not mean that uh, Jesus is, uh, as I think some early Christians and some later ones uh, supposed, um, God walking around dressed up, uh, as it were, in human form. An identity Christology is perfectly compatible with acknowledging the phenomena of Jesus' life as we see them uh, characterized in the Gospels as somebody who was hungry, somebody who was tired, somebody who asked questions because he didn't know the answers, and so forth. Um, and identity Christology doesn't have any particular implications for uh, many of those aspects of the phenomenon. It doesn't get in the way of uh, Jesus having been somebody who was very much experienced and who would have experienced himself as a human person. But an identity Christology is one that asserts that at root, uh, at the uh, uh, if we fully understand what's going on, we understand that the person uh, who is Jesus of Nazareth is at the same time the person who is God the Word. So that's an identity Christology. Uh, by contrast, we have Christologies that we might describe as Christologies of 
inspiration or vocation that in one way or another draw a sharper distinction between deity and humanity in relation to the person of Jesus. And uh, so these are sometimes talked about as Nestorian Christologies in light of the uh, writings of the, the early, uh, early Christian uh, theologian Nestorius. Uh, there is some reason to think that he was not himself a Nestorian, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Uh, in any event, the theme that we talk about, the Nestorian theme in Christology, is one that really sees uh, a sharper distinction between the human Jesus of Nazareth and God the Word, and sees the relationship between, between the two as more external than, a, than identity Christologies do. And uh, so uh, we can talk about uh, this sort of vocational or inspirational Christology as one in which incarnation, uh, if we want to talk about Jesus as God incarnate, incarnation becomes a kind of intensification of prophetic inspiration. Okay? So um, these alternative views, identity Christology and inspiration Christology, um, have persisted throughout the, throughout the history of Christianity. Uh, they've been, uh, you know, different uh, versions of uh, each view uh, have been popular at different times. What I want to suggest here is that, very quickly, it seems pretty obvious that our view of divine action is going to have implications for how we sort out this choice among, uh, among uh, options in Christology. That if we understand the uh, nature of divine action in the world as persuasive, whether, okay, whether that is persuasive action for metaphysical reasons or persuasive action, exclusively persuasive action for moral reasons doesn't matter, uh, either way, what we're going to have then pretty clearly is a reason, a very strong reason to prefer uh, a Christology of inspiration, right? Because a Christology of inspiration um, is compatible with talking about divine action as, as persuasive in the world, uh, whereas a, an identity Christology, it seems, will require a kind of divine interruption of ordinary causal processes in the world and a kind of, if you will, insertion of divine presence in the world that uh, will, uh, uh, be, will make sense only if there are at least occasional miracles. And so, a Christology of identity is going to work only then if we have uh, the view that the constraints on divine action that account for the problem of evil are moral constraints such that therefore at least occasionally it will be morally appropriate for those to be um, suspended and for more direct divine action in the world to take place. So that's just a very brief summation of that point and we can talk more about it. Uh, one thing that's worth noting as a kind of side point in this regard is the implication, I think, of this way of thinking and talking for a perennial Adventist debate uh, that has assumed very often a Christology of identity, but has been interested in the, the character of the humanness of God incarnate. Okay? And, of course, uh, this is the, the ongoing uh, debate, uh, probably quieter now than at some earlier times in Adventist history, uh, over the question whether the humanity of Jesus uh, featured uh, kind of, if you will, inner promptings to do evil. Uh, and uh, so, uh, of course, as we know, uh, some, uh, some folks have seen, seen it as obvious that uh, the humanity of Jesus uh, would have to have been like the humanity that all of us uh, experience, in which these inner promptings to evil are evident, and others uh, have argued that uh, this wouldn't, wouldn't be the case. Uh, so pretty clearly, again, if you've got a Christology of inspiration, because there is a, uh, an understanding of divine action as persuasive uh, rather than coercive, then again, there will be no very obvious way for uh, divine providence, persuasive divine providence, to bring it about that the humanity of Jesus is somehow free of all promptings toward, uh, toward evil. Um, now, there may be some way in which divine providence, understood persuasively, can uh, nudge and lure and shape history in such a way that uh, the particular set of inner promptings uh, present in the humanity of Jesus 
uh, might be particularly limited, but there's, there's no realistic way, absent some kind of miraculous act, for that to, uh, uh, to be the case. Um, so again, if you want a view of uh, the humanity of Jesus as uh, free from these, these inner promptings to evil, then what you've got to have is a view of divine action as at least occasionally miraculous, and the constraints are normative, and those constraints can occasionally be released. Um, but the thing to note about this, it seems to me, is that if you then want to go on and talk about um, the sinlessness of Jesus, how you answer that earlier question is kind of uh, irrelevant if you've got an identity Christology. Because if you've got an identity Christology, um, I think, uh, and I'll just assert this boldly, you can, I argue for it a bit more in the chapter, uh, but if you've got an identity Christology, it's going to be the fact that Jesus is God incarnate that accounts for Jesus' sinlessness. It's not going to be uh, some feature of Jesus' humanity. I mean, I think it's just wildly improbable to suppose that um, it's just a coincidence, right, that uh, someone uh, is both God incarnate and the only sinless person. Um, so, in any event, uh, I think uh, it's worth thinking about those matters in that connection. With regard to salvation, the other uh, element of the chapter, the other focus of the chapter, there are a number of things that um, I think are probably worth saying, and I talk about uh, uh, several aspects of what we might want to say about salvation in the chapter that aren't directly related to this issue of uh, uh, divine action, and that have to do primarily with difficulties that are evident with regard to uh, various uh, popular views of salvation uh, among Christians. Uh, it seems as if uh, very frequently we find Christians talking as if, well, first of all, there's no, there's no consistent understanding for what people mean by salvation. And if we think about the history of Christianity, we can be clear that salvation um, has a lot of different meanings. We can find uh, patristic authors uh, understanding salvation as liberation from mortality. Uh, there's also, of course, the early patristic view that, in effect, salvation is liberation from the dominion of the devil, who has somehow managed to uh, acquire title to, uh, uh, to us, and, of course, who, in that uh, famous uh, Gregory of Nyssa parable, is uh, kind of conned by God into uh, accepting a trade. You know, God incarnate uh, will be traded for, for humanity, but aha, uh, Jesus rises from the dead and therefore escapes uh, diabolic clutches, and so uh, the, uh, the trade, you know, God, God's a very effective, uh, effective bargainer in this case. Um, but uh, in any event, so liberation from divine, from diabolic uh, superintendence uh, in, uh, of course, the Middle Ages, we have Anselm telling us that in effect, uh, salvation is uh, a kind of restoration of lost honor, of uh, relationship with God broken by uh, our attack on divine honor. Uh, we've got uh, Abelard, by contrast, suggesting that uh, salvation is uh, uh, kind of wooing our loyalty back to God through the winsome display of divine love in Jesus. Uh, in the uh, Reformation, post-Reformation era, we get the idea of penal substitution that uh, somehow salvation is uh, uh, entitling God to forgive us, something apparently God couldn't otherwise do, uh, you know, in virtue of uh, Jesus having suffered a punishment that we deserve. And uh, you know, we find some more recent views that talk about salvation as the creation of community or the uh, conferral of meaning on our lives uh, and so forth. So there's this broad range of views in Christian history and uh, there's never been a consensus about these. I mean, I think it's <coughs> frequently noted, and I think interestingly so, that in the early uh, uh, ecumenical Christian creeds, in no case do we find a theological explication of a view of salvation. There's often a great deal of stuff about other theological topics, especially, of course, the Nicene and uh, Chalcedonian creeds about the identity of Jesus. But we don't find anything like this with regard to uh, salvation. So the Nicene Creed famously just says, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And that's uh, you know, really about all we get. Uh, so the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed both talk about the forgiveness of sins. By all means, God is a forgiver. But there's not an attempt to uh, spell out a 
theology of this. In any event, um, I dwell on a number of, of things in the chapter. I try to explain why it seems to me that um, penal substitution, for instance, penal substitution, for instance, is a deeply unsatisfactory view. Um, so it first of all purports to be a retributive view. Um, retribution, I think, is deeply problematic morally. Uh, but then it goes on to suggest that retributive punishment itself can be substituted, which again I think is a, is a view that makes very little sense. So um, I think that's a, that's a view that we certainly ought not to ought not to embrace for a whole range of reasons. I suggest in the uh, in the chapter that. Uh, um, well, there are a number of things that we say, since, that I say, since we're, uh, I, I want us to have some time to talk as a group, let me just note the one, one thing that I devote a fair amount of time to at the end of the chapter. Um, it's become very common in um, Christian circles, both, both Protestant and Catholic, and uh, you know, it's increasingly receiving attention within Adventism as well, um, to affirm the idea of universal salvation. And uh, I spend a little time in the, toward the end of the chapter on that topic, noting that, again, if we've got a view of divine action as persuasive, uh, this is going to make some versions of belief in universal salvation untenable. Um, that is, some versions of universal salvation seem to involve the view that uh, God, in effect, uh, unilaterally uh, transforms uh, people uh, in such a way that they respond to right to divine grace. Um, I suggest that there are what, six, six or seven different uh, aspects of salvation and that some of those can indeed be effected unilaterally uh, by God, but that others require uh, human responses. And while there's no reason to suppose uh, if we're going to have a view that's consistent with believing divine love, that God is uh, in the business, again, of inflicting retributive punishments on people, um, we can't say a priori, we can't say in advance, that uh, all aspects of salvation can be effected unilaterally by God, and uh, therefore, uh, at least some, some versions of, of universalism are going to have to be at best hopeful uh, on, on that matter, rather than uh, certain uh, much less dogmatic. So I'm happy to talk more about anything else I've said in uh, either uh, portion of the chapter, but I think probably instead of holding forth on that uh, uh, without interruption, what I should do is sit down and take a breath and uh, find out what particularly interests the members of this thoughtful group. Yeah, Forrest. And I should ask, by the way, uh, Dave, do you have a way of picking up for us, or do we need to circulate the mic? Or, uh, okay. In your article, you discussed a lot of free issue of free will. Yes. How do you handle the uh, conclusions of many? Uh, Jacques Fresco, Susan Blackmore, Sam Harris, and others who say that free will is just an illusion, that we've already made our mind up our brain has already told us what we're going to do before we do it. So, do you have any comments on that? Well, so obviously, if there's no free will, then I think we have a decisive disproof of any God worth believing in. Okay? I, Calvinists wouldn't say that. I, I think that's right. Um, my own view is that our own experience is pretty decisive on this point. Uh, that is to say, I don't believe in free will first and foremost because it's a posit of my theology or because, as is true for some people, it's a posit of their morality. They need to, uh, to blame people and therefore think they need to be uh, held uh, responsible. Uh, my own view is that we start out uh, with a very, very decisive thumb on the scale uh, in favor of, of belief in free will, and that's our own experience of choosing freely. Um, Rick is an expert on this, and I'm a dilettante, and I'd love to hear from him. But my own sense is that the, uh, uh, you know, Ben Libet's experiments, for instance, which are sometimes cited in support of the view you just described, um, really don't clearly uh, ground that, that conclusion, and Libet himself doesn't, in fact, embrace that conclusion. 
you read his own book, uh, talking about his experiment, experiments mind to time, uh, Libet himself will say that uh, he, he thinks that there is, uh, he, he, he reads the, the, uh, the stuff, uh, the, the experimental results, uh, in such a way that he thinks there is always the opportunity for a kind of veto uh, that we exercise on the ongoing movement of uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the nervous system in a particular direction. Uh, so he doesn't think his own experiments yield the conclusion that Harris and some other people do. And there are other people, other philosophers who read, uh, uh, who read Lippitt who would say that that's not uh, a fair conclusion either from, uh, from the, the experimental work. Uh, but in any event, my view is we start out with, ex with experience, as Dr. Johnson said, all theory is against it, all experience is for it. I begin with the experience. Yeah, David. Two things. The first, I hope you just say, yes, you're right, and then <laughs> the other, uh, more seriously. When we think about the problem of evil, we often talk about moral evil and natural evil. And I wonder if we don't need increasingly to talk about ecological evil or the, the predatory nature of everything and that that may present the, the most serious objection to divine love. That's, that's one point. The other one though is on this distinction between metaphysical and moral evil and you mentioned a third, capac a third option there but I wonder if there isn't 3A which would say that actually for a morally good actuality, the, disti the distinction fades. And that even in human life, we can see circumstances where a father, for instance, might say to a child, I can't do that. And literally would be unable physically to do it because it would be so morally reprehensible to do it. And so I wonder if the distinction between a moral impossibility and a metaphysical impossibility might not hold, might fail to hold even in human life, let alone the life of God. So I think that's, a, that's really interesting, and I, this is, a, is, of course, a point you have been making very articulately for some time, right, that there's a, uh, um, that if divine goodness is metaphysically necessary, as we should say it is, and if, if the uh, normative constraints on divine action flow from divine goodness, is that much, you know, that's still a metaphysical constraint, in a sense, uh, that's just as robust as the sort of constraint that we might find in like Edmund Hartshorn. Um, I guess the difference is just that one might think that how that normative constraint uh, played out in terms of divine action, you know, might allow for more flexibility or freedom of divine action than would be the case um, if the constraints purely metaphysical. Maybe not. Of course, the proponents of uh, my kind of option to be would say it certainly is because those constraints allow for the occasional miracle. And, uh, and that's really where I think the distinction becomes important, if you think that kind of uh, uh, possibility is on the table. Now, obviously, you might not, and that's a different matter. But uh, uh, if you think that option is on the table, the only way that could even be permitted to be on the table, obviously, would be in virtue of some account of the constraints as, uh, uh, as normative and allowing for that. Uh, as regards the, the problem of predation, uh, I think that's just devastatingly difficult. You know. I've tried to write about that. I had quite a long article in the Journal of Religious Studies about 10 years ago um, talking about the way in which process theodicy handles animal suffering and uh, suggesting that the more I thought through it, the more difficult that was. Um, I think I've got something to say there, but it's certainly not very confident. So yes, I agree that that's a, that's a real problem. Could I go back to the first part, just, yeah. just to clarify, maybe for people here who might enjoy a vivid illustration, and that is, you and I, the reason I started thinking this way is that you and I have a colleague who has often said, it would make no sense for me to try to have an affair because at the moment of closest encounter, I would feel so guilty that I could not mm -hmm. uh, consummate, consummate the, um, the event. Yeah. So there's a, there's a moral constraint that is causing a physical 
Yeah. One, and I, that's what got me thinking about this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's a helpful thing. Please, am I on again? Gary, I wonder if you could help me come up with some alternative to the, the two terms that wind up in a dichotomy, persuasive versus coercive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because given those options, we think about God as love, we naturally are going to gravitate toward, it must be persuasive. Mm -hmm. If God is coercive, well, that means that God is determining what happens and not respecting our mm -hmm. uh, capacity to respond to him. Now, that takes some people, like Tom Ord, mm -hmm. to the idea that God never controls a mm -hmm. loving God. He's written right. a book, Uncontrolling Love. Right. And uh, um, I'm wondering if there, you know, I don't like the idea of, of God manipulating, controlling in a coercive way. And yet I think the idea to go to the other extreme and say, well, God never uh, takes over. God always just lets things happen doesn't quite work either. Um, I'm thinking a lot about my son lately. He has a birthday this week. And I'm thinking about our years, over the years, how he's come to where he is. And I can remember a couple of times where while I wanted to encourage him to make wise decisions and come to the right conclusion, there were a couple of times where we said, uh, when he was a teenager and even later, this is what you're going to do. You know, where you're going, it doesn't seem to us to be where you ultimately want to take yourself, where you ultimately want to be. And so you're going to do this. And uh, we just insisted. And I don't think he would have wound up where he did if we hadn't taken the, the initiative <laughs> Assume, asserted the parental prerogative of just, shall we say, demanding that he follow a certain course of action. Not because we wanted to restrict his options, but because we wanted to expand the options that he would have. So is there some way of, of identifying a, uh, a directive activity of God where God, I, I don't know, the, the word intervene or the word interfere or the word exception, maybe that's okay. But the other, it, it gravitates towards coercion and it sounds like, well, if you did something like that, you were acting in a coercive way and that's inconsistent with love. And I wonder if there aren't, there isn't a counterpart to God doing things that may be extraordinary from one standpoint, but because not because he wants to constrain or restrict our options, but because God wants to enhance and open our options to us. So, but coercion is an unattractive way of identifying that, and rather than seeing that as somehow an exception to what the loving God does, see that as an expression of what a loving God does uh, in the face of specific needs and circumstances. So, I think you're absolutely right, Rick that our rhetoric can provide an overly convenient short circuit of the, of the, uh, the conversation, right? So um, by using the language of persuasion, persuasion and coercion, uh, and that pair, of course, I think is, is essentially what head in. Um, by using that pair, I um, undoubtedly serve to tilt the conversation a certain way. So, um, the distinction that I want to draw, I guess, is between divine action that occurs in and through creaturely action. So it's not a matter of, I can't think of the exact phrase you used, but just kind of letting things happen. Because on the, on the, the, the uh, both views that I'm talking about, divine action is going to be uh, constant. It's not going to be the case that God's ever sort of taken a vacation. Uh, but instead is going to be actively and particularly present in particular situations. But maybe we need uh, less question-begging language than the language of coercion. Um, you know, we might distinguish between, you know, between mediated and non-mediated action, because that's really, I think, kind of the point, that, uh, that uh, the 
option 2B, if you will, uh, is going to be one in accordance with which some divine acts, uh, almost certainly a very small number, but some divine acts will be, instead of being mediated through, uh, in and through creaturely processes and actions will occur immediately and directly. And so I might talk about immediate and direct action uh, versus uh, persuasive or collaborative action. Um, I certainly don't want to beg the, uh, the question by using the wrong sort of rhetoric that, that tugs in the wrong way. Now, then I think the theological or philosophical question of whether there can be, whether it makes sense to talk as proponents of option 2B would, would do uh, about, uh, you know, occasional instances of really direct, unmediated divine action. Uh, that conversation obviously still has to be had, but it certainly we can do better on the rhetoric and I think your points fail. Do you want to say more? Well, I just think there were occasions when, what should I say, my wife and I were extremely persuasive. <laughs> and I wonder if there's a counterpart there. God just says, I'm going to persuade this so there's, it's going to go one way on certain, you know, somewhat limited out. I, I don't know. Thank Could you. I jump in here, Gary, just for a bit? Of course. It seems to me that talking about coerce, coercive divine power is difficult because we equate that with supernatural and that the word supernatural has come to mean contranatural. Mm -hmm. And that because we're, we're allergic to contranatural, we don't want to talk about coercive power. However, if supernatural meant more like I think Aquinas meant it, that is, it's an infusion of divine power through the natural processes rather than being contrary to those, I wonder if something like what Rick is saying becomes more plausible. Well, I think the rhetoric helps there, but we still have the question whether there can be divine action that's unconstrained and unmediated. And whatever rhetoric uh, uh, we choose to employ by way of framing that, that's the kind of action that I think poses the most severe problem for, you know, for the problem of evil. And therefore, I think, is the kind that uh, has been the source of the most discomfiture on the part of people trying to think about the Odyssey. So, I'm, I'm a big fan of Aquinas. By all means, let's talk about uh, uh, nature and supernature in that way. Uh, but we still have to ask the question of whether uh, you know, the uh, uh, possibility of unmediated direct uh, divine action, unconstrained divine action uh, of the kind that, again, my option 2B allows for, um, you know, whether that's something we want to affirm. I'm not saying we shouldn't. I'm just saying there's a price tag associated with doing so. Yeah. Um, how would you characterize God's action in Saul on the road to Damascus? So I don't, you know, I, I don't have any kind of special insight into into that kind of uh, into that kind of event, um, and I'm I'm hesitant to try to uh, sort of do the historical spade work required to make sense of any uh, any event like that. But let's just say. You take that event at face value, if you're, and take the report in, in Acts at face value, if you are a proponent of one of the two views in accordance with which divine action is all persuasive, then, you know, you're going to tell a story in which there's probably a lot of perhaps partly unconscious inner turmoil going on in Saul's mind. And at the same time, I mean, it's certainly going to be the case that uh, um, the I hate to use this term; it sounds tacky, but the you know the discarnate Jesus uh, of Nazareth is going to be able to uh, uh, you know communicate post mortem with uh, uh, with Saul on the road to Damascus, and uh, that will uh, that that communication on the part of Jesus is going to interact in some way with this. Uh, inner turmoil that's probably been playing out in, in Saul's uh, psyche. Um, if you take the view that there can be some instances of unmediated divine action and that this is such an instance, because of course just because you believe there can be such instances doesn't settle the question of what's the case in the particular instance. Um, you know, then perhaps the uh, appearance, uh, I mean I think, I think you can account for the appearance of, of Jesus um, in a way that doesn't involve any particular appeal to miracle, but it, it, certainly if you've got the, the view of divine action is possibly unmediated, uh, then there can be perhaps something more dramatic going on there that is miraculous. I don't, I'm not sure I have anything much smarter to say about 
the Peter. In very dense chapter with many interesting ideas that we can discuss in more than 20 minutes at the time. You're right. Uh, two, two statements uh, that you make in the chapter, if you would like to comment and to expand a little bit on them. The first one is, if God is love, he is not in control. And the second statement is that uh, uh, missionary activity is not important for salvation because God can find other means, I mean, th that we don't need to send missionaries to talk about gospel or the message of Jesus Christ because God will find some other ways to impress on the people. Is not this coming a little bit in, in contradiction with Jesus uh, when he's telling us go into the whole world and make disciples and preach them? Okay, so let me try quickly to comment on both both themes in the in the chapter, Peter. Thank you for calling those to our attention. So um, it seems to me that the the claim that if God is love, then God is not in control uh, follows from what we experience in the world. There is evil in the world. Uh, if God is love, then God does not intend that evil. And if God does not intend the evil, then God doesn't intend some things that happen, and yet those things happen. Therefore, I think, it follows that there are things that happen that are contrary to God's intentions, and therefore, God doesn't control every event that, that, that happens. God doesn't uh, unilaterally realize divine purposes in the world. Um, with regard to mission, um, I don't think that what I said was that there is no reason to send missionaries to sp spread the gospel. What I suggested was that the success or failure of efforts to spread the gospel don't determine whether people are loved by God and embraced by God, and uh, whether they, that doesn't determine that people are in right relation to God. Rather, I suggest uh, there are other things that mission is good for, um, and talking about uh, uh, sharing a particular vision of reality is certainly one of the things that uh, uh, it can be good for. It's just that that isn't a matter of, as it were, saving people, uh, depending on what, what uh, strand of talk about salvation we have in mind. Uh, I note these various strands of salvation. There are some aspects of salvation uh, making people's lives better in various ways uh, for which mission can certainly be very useful in challenging uh, morally broken structures and uh, ones that are, that are embedded in visions that are destructive. Uh, it's just that uh, what it's not good for is getting people, uh, as it were, uh, loved by God. No, I got, you got five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Yeah, please. <clears throat> Do I understand? Coercion is where you, you go against the person's will. You force them to do a certain thing. That's not exactly the way, I mean, I, I guess I'm using coercion as a technical term here, and so uh, perhaps that's another reason uh, why it's good not to uh, uh, ignore things that Rick Rice says, and uh, uh, we should instead think about some other ways of putting the matter. When I talk about coercion, what I mean is that God's will is realized unilaterally, uh, so that whether we're talking about the behavior of inanimate objects or of living creatures, uh, that, uh, that they do uh, whatever it is that, that God intends. And that might include not, uh, as a matter of fact, contrary to the will of the creatures, but making it the case that the creature willed something. But where do you want to go with that? Well, I was just thinking that it would be easy for God to have prevented evil in the first place. I mean, that would have been a coercive act. You would see he could have tied Lucifer up and, and he would have had no access to the rest of the angelic posts. But he, he didn't. Um, he probably tried to compel him to walk in the way of, of righteousness. But it just seems to me that in the world we live in today, it's cause and effect. Basically, that's it. That God, God does not interfere. And if he does, we call that a miracle. And then that can even be explained. Right. And that's the kind of issue that I'm, that I'm wrestling with beginning and trying to, to frame and clarify that. So yeah, I think you're, you're right that our experience is precisely in that kind of world. I think you get the last... Uh, oh. uh, Most of this is completely above my head. I, don't I, I want to comment <laughs> um, on the basis of my years as a missionary, 
when I myself question things like that, when, you know, what's this word? Yeah. It seems to me that because